Hey folks, I'm here today to talk to you about all the books I read in October. It took me a while to get started in October. I didn't read anything for the last 10 days of September or the first week of October, which felt very surreal and strange to me. It made me feel out of sorts, but I had so much reading to do outside of all of this for work and um, competition judging that I didn't read for pleasure. So by the time I got round to reading for pleasure, some books I didn't gel with in DNF, which is fine. I'm fine with DNFing, but obviously we don't want to. We want to love all the books we read. Some books I loved and some books I didn't enjoy as much as I'd hoped to. So a real range of books last month. I will list anything that I do talk about in the description box down below. I also read some of these books in reading vlogs throughout the month last month. So I'll link the relevant videos in the description box down below because I'll have gone into a lot of detail as I was reading them. So today we're going to whiz through my site. <laughs> can't speak whiz through my final thoughts on these books. There we go. Also later this week, I am gonna be doing a holiday gift guide book recommendation video. So if you need a book recommendation to give as a gift, not the recommendation, the book itself, to a person in your life, and you haven't already asked for that recommendation, I'll link my previous video down below. You can leave a comment there and I will answer as many of those as I can in my next video. Today I am not wearing a wig because I am pushing against this real urge I've been feeling recently, the need to wear wigs in videos even when I don't particularly want to wear a wig and that's something that I didn't ever want to do when I started wearing wigs earlier this year. It was never supposed to be every single day and I don't wear them off camera every single day and um, I tend to just wear beanie hats a lot of the time because they're comfortable. Um, but that's the thing with wearing wigs and stuff. The more you get used to seeing yourself wearing them, the more I think I feel the need to kind of keep up appearances in that respect, which is ableism and not something that I want to be doing. And I've given myself a talking to. And um, yeah, I'm not wearing a wig today. And I know I didn't have to address that, but I just wanted to mention because I think sometimes, you know, talking about these things, it may seem as though disability wise, <laughs> maybe it doesn't seem like this, but sometimes I worry that it, it looks like I've got all the things figured out about how I feel about certain things. And just, just a reminder that I don't, and we all have to be kind to ourselves. And this stuff can be a bit, you know, up and down. So I'm not wearing a wig and that's fine. And I want to feel okay with not wearing a wig if I don't want to. Anyway, segue. Right, let's talk about what I read last month. Let's begin with the DNFs because there were two. One of them I don't have to hand because I only had it on audio and that was The Family Upstairs by Lisa Jewell. Big bestseller, she definitely doesn't need me to love it. Um, and I picked it up because I wanted to read a new thriller and I just didn't feel very compelled by it. I found the characters a bit boring. It just, it just wasn't appealing to me and I listened to about an hour and a half, two hours of the audiobook and just thought, you know what, I'm just gonna put this down for now. I may go back to it. I'm not sure if it's the book or me or a combination of both, but there we are. And the other one that I DNF'd, I was really sad about, and that's The Second Woman by Louise May. And it's translated from the French by Louise Rogers Lalaurie. So intrigued by the premise of this, still intrigued by the premise of this actually. Um, it's about a woman who is dating a man and she first met him or, or came across him on the news because he was making a plea for his wife to return because she had gone missing. And this woman saw this man on television mourning his wife or being worried that she may be dead and became really infatuated with him and reached out to him, felt sorry for him. It was a weird relationship to begin with. And now she's with him and he's a very controlling person and the first wife comes back, the first woman, and she has to deal with that. Like, sounds like an amazing premise, right? It is an amazing premise, but the reason that I personally DNF'd it is because it's a very, it's a very violent book emotionally and also it does have some physical violence in it as well. And I just it's not something that I felt comfortable reading. You're obviously not supposed to feel comfortable reading it, but it's just not something that I wanted to be reading. The narrator is very harsh and rude and mean about pretty much everyone that she sees and their appearance. And the reason that she's like that is because she was treated that way when she was younger. So we're seeing the cause and effect of that, but it is very in your face. There's a lot of self-hatred, a lot of ableism, a lot of fat phobia, just a lot of horribleness in this, as well as physical violence too. And it's just not something that I particularly am drawn to reading written 
like that. So that one wasn't for me, but um, if you don't mind reading about stuff like that, as I said, the premise is super intriguing. Then where shall I go to next? Let me see. Okay, well, let me get these quickly out of the way. Um, I read the final two Frida Klein books, um, which is Sunday Morning Coming Down. Is it? Yes, <laughs> I should know. I've read it so many times now. And Day of the Dead. So the two final Frida Klein books, I've been doing my usual bi-annual listen through so I finished listening to them that was a delight that was why I actually picked up the family upstairs because I finished that and wanted to read a new thriller and when the family upstairs didn't suffice I decided to pick up a new to me Patricia Highsmith because she never disappoints I won't talk about the Nikki French books because I have talked to you so much about them before but as usual whenever I mention a book of theirs I will link a video down below where I have spoken about all their books in detail. The Frida Klein series remains my favourite crime series of all time, would obviously highly recommend it, especially the audiobooks narrated by Beth Chalmers. All right so I then picked up Deep Water by Patricia Highsmith. Last week, last week I made a video, or the week before, recently made a video talking about upcoming book to film adaptations this is one of them there's a new film of this coming out next year starring Ben Affleck this is a book about a marriage where the marriage has taken a direction that maybe the participants didn't foresee initially it's become very messy and stressful for them which is probably not fun for them but very fun for us to read about it's set in the 1950s it's about Vic and Melinda Melinda is very openly having affairs and when I say openly I don't just mean that her husband knows about it I mean everyone knows about them so she will bring Vic her husband along to dinner parties but she will also bring her boyfriend along at the same time and lots of whispers ensue it's great discussion of gender actually because Vic's friends wouldn't mind if he was the one having the affair they would probably want him to be more subtle about it than Melinda is being but because he's a man they'd be okay with it but because she's the one having the affair they don't really know how to deal. Like with a lot of Patricia Highsmith's books, there is this undercurrent of queerness going on and Vic at several points says to Melinda or to himself, to us as well, the reader, that he wouldn't mind if she brought a different kind of man home and maybe the three of them could have a lot of fun together. So I think he's quite jealous of the men that she is dating. But in a bid to try and get the men to go away to save some kind of social face, he tells one of them that he murdered one of his wife's previous boyfriends to try and scare this new one away. And then this rumor gets around town. But did he kill this previous boyfriend? I won't say more than that because then it kind of spirals into this whole beast and I don't want to spoil anything for anyone that happens real close to the beginning of the book I love the imagery that's in here Vic works for a publishing company he translates people's poetry and he likes being in control of narratives and storytelling which obviously trickles into his real life when he's planting these stories about whether or not he potentially murdered somebody you know he messes with the people in his life like they are characters in a book that he is writing and his wife does the same as well she treats him in this disposable way she's very used to him being there and she wants to create subplots of her own thank you very much Vic also keeps snails and he likes to observe the way that they love each other and something that I found out recently one of you told me actually you slid into my dms on instagram and told me did I want to know a fun fact about Patricia Highsmith that she used to carry around snails and lettuce in her handbag to all dinner parties and she would just entertain herself by looking at her pet snails instead of, you know, entering into lots of conversations with people. And to that, I say, Patricia, what a gem you are. So I really loved this book. The very ending of the book, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I didn't hate it. It just didn't go in quite the direction that I anticipated, but I still really enjoyed the book a lot. Um, and I have loved or really liked all of the books of hers that I have read. And I look forward to reading 
more. I then read Piranesi by Susanna Clark. I'm not going to talk about this here because I wrote a review of it for Toast but suffice to say I really loved it. I thought it was a beautiful constellation of a novel which made me think about loads of different books that I'd read before which I think is the intention of this book because it's about a character called Piranesi who's trying to understand the world he lives in by the fragments that he comes across and I think we are supposed to think about fragments of other books and media that are reminiscent of the world that he lives in in order to contextualize his existence. So things like Narnia and his dark materials and Kazuishi Guru. I just had loads of thoughts when I read this. So I will link my article in the description box down below. I think it's particularly interesting to think about this book through the lens of disability because Susanna Clarke wrote it after she became chronically ill herself. And the way that it discusses time and space in relation to disability, I think is really interesting. So that will be linked in the description box down below. Two picture books that I read last month that I have spoken about again in a vlog, which I'll link below, were The Queen in the Cave by Julia Sada, which is a book that I, I feel like it contains a whole novel in the space of a few pages. There's so much to discuss in here. It's essentially about one sister who's feeling older than her two other sisters, and she wants to go on an adventure to meet the queen who lives in the cave. And the queen looks like her, is essentially another version of her, and her two younger siblings feel kind of left behind. And they're scared by her counter self in this form of a queen. It is reminiscent of Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan. And it's uh, haunting, really, really haunting. The illustrations, are beautiful let me show you a couple of pages but it really is about how scary it is to grow up and how you can feel things about growing up before you understand them properly and how isolating that can be i loved it i think it's a great jumping off point to talking to kids about complicated feelings that they might not be able to voice just yet i thought it was great i also read there's a ghost in this house by Oliver Jeffers, which uses this tracing paper to great effect because it's about a girl who is wandering through, let me find you a page, who's wandering through a house and she says that she can't see any of the ghosts and can we, the reader, help her? So in each page you will see an illustration like this and then you turn over, it's hard to do this on camera, but you turn over this piece of like tracing paper and then you can see the ghosts and you can shout through the book and try and tell her where they are. I thought that was rather delightful. The next book I read was a non-fiction book and I listened to this one on audio. It's Brown Baby by Nikesh Shukla. This is a memoir. It's written in letter format as this written exploration of, of ideas for his daughter. He talks about how to talk to her about race and gender and family and food. It's about the death of his mum and how that made him reflect on both childhood and parenthood and inheritance and things to pass on to the younger generations and the passing of time. It's really beautiful and what I really liked about this book is that it doesn't present definitive answers. He's not saying, okay daughter, I have thought very critically about all of these things and this is all the wisdom that you need. It's more, these are things that I didn't think about until a certain part in my life. And these are things I still want to learn about, but this is what I know right now. And these are things that I have reflected on. This is how I've grown as a person and how I would like to continue growing and, and learning more about this world. It's, it's very honest in that respect and very familiar as as in family and therefore it feels quite a privilege to be able to be part of this conversation that he's having with his daughter and writing down for his daughter i spoke about this more as i was reading it and listening to the audiobook you also got some snapshots at the end of a podcast that he did also called brown baby where he was talking to different author friends about their relationship with their children and with parenthood and i thought that, that was really lovely i haven't actually listened to the podcast yet but i may check that out at some point. I also read The Fell by Sarah Moss. This was an interesting reading experience because I didn't enjoy the process of reading it, but I wasn't supposed to enjoy it. It's just so tense. And her books recently have been like this, um, but 
especially in the last three titles, so in Ghost Wall, Summer Water, and now in The Fell, it's been super uncomfortable and intense to read because you know that something not very nice is going to happen and you're waiting for it to happen. You feel like you're holding your breath throughout the whole thing. I think this one is particularly tense because it's set right now. So this is about a woman called Kate who's been told that she needs to quarantine because she came into contact with someone who was positive at work and now she needs to wait for two weeks but she doesn't want to wait for two weeks. She's feeling really claustrophobic, even though she has a garden that she can go into. So she decides that she's going to go for a walk and that will be fine because no one will see her. But of course then, pun, she goes to the fells and she falls (laughs) and she is stuck there. And now she's reflecting on, oh my God, like the shame of that, but also the repercussions, the ripples. Now all these people have to come and rescue her and endanger themselves then she has to go to a hospital where she potentially could be a danger to other people. It's not supposed to be a, a morally righteous tale in that respect, um, but more just a spiderweb look at the knock-on effect of things and and how complicated that is and acknowledging everyone's experience of what we've been going through, but also seeing how some people can use the excuse of oh I need to do this for my mental health forgetting about other people's mental health um as well as not just you know the physical implications of what you're doing but how lots of other people would like to do things for the betterment of their mental health but it would impact them physically it's just a lot to discuss and unpack in a tiny book um and as I said when I was reading it as someone who who has been shielding it's really intense to read. I think it'd be really intense for anyone to read, but super stressful. She's a brilliant writer though. And if she wasn't, you wouldn't feel stressed reading it. So I did feel in safe hands with her. That was good. Then I read Ghost in the Throat by Doreen Griffith. I actually listened to this on audio. It's narrated by Siobhan McSweeney, who's an actress who was in Derry Girls and presents The Great Pottery Throwdown. Listening to this on audiobook, I would so recommend because there is Irish poetry in here and you get to hear that as it is intended, which is obviously fantastic. This wasn't quite what I expected from reading the blurb because it says that it's about a woman, it is part autofiction memoir, so about Dreen herself, having children and then reflecting back on this poem that she was obsessed with when she was younger and trying to research. It was a poem that was written in blood. And I thought, that sounds really gothic. Just the, the way it was written was really focused on on, on murder and, and drinking people's blood and writing poetry using that blood. I thought, oh, hello. Um, so I think I thought it was going to be a little bit in the vein of Night Bitch by Rachel Yoda, which it is, but it isn't as magical realist as that sounds it's more in the vein of Liz Berry, Sarah Moss looking at exhausted motherhood which I'm still very interested in and loved it but I think also some of you said from reading the blurb it wasn't quite what you had thought it was going to be when you got to it so the book is about um the author's experience of motherhood she has four children herself and how exhausting that is and the routines she becomes as the blurb suggests obsessed with this poem from ages ago a poem that she really loved when she was a teenager and she thought she'd remembered it a specific way and then when she went back to it she realized that she'd conjured this whole narrative that didn't exist so she tries to find the real in inverted commas history of this poem and the reason it's hard to pin down is because of oral tradition it's a bit like the history of folklore which you know i speak about a lot on this channel in that these stories and in this case this poem the story of the poem was told a lot orally and then it was written down by people and when it was written down it was kind of contained and that's how she feels in her new motherhood as though society is trying to contain her and she wants to find the truth of these things that she is experiencing so there's a lot of imagery metaphor extended metaphor going on to do with essentially bodily fluids like milk and blood and the writing of text the writing of this poem in blood um women as bodies of text this poem as a body how it has been shaped by society how society would like to contain it tell it have people remember it this is her way of finding a kinship with women throughout time who have gone through the same experiences but have been told that they have to talk about it in a certain way so i really enjoyed this book but it wasn't particularly what i was expecting if you do want to pick it up i would as i said highly recommend the audiobook I paused because my neighbour was mowing her lawn. 
I think she's finished now. We are losing the light, but we are on to the final book. So this is the last book I read last month, which is Dead Relatives by Lucy McKnight Hardy. It's a short story collection, and I spoke about it in depth in a reading vlog, which I'll link down below. So I'll just speak about it very quickly here. It's hard to talk about because her writing is exquisite. It's atmospheric, it's evocative. She knows how to walk away and leave you at the end of a story with a shiver. But I can't get away from the way that this book handles disability and disabled characters. It's used in a very stereotypical horror way where we're supposed to feel uncomfortable about somebody's physical appearance. And you can tell that by the way that someone's appearance is described and the language that is used. In the first story, which actually takes up the first third of the book, it's about a disabled young girl who lives in a house with her mother where people called the ladies come to visit. These women are pregnant. And basically the message of the story without getting into too much detail about it is that her mother is very happy to kill non-disabled children because she is so annoyed that she had disabled children herself and it saddened her. So she wants to take it out on the rest of the world. And disability is included in a couple of other stories as well. And it's just always used as a, as a plot device, as a metaphor, instead of, you know, disabled people exist and people with disfigurements exist. And it, you know, I mean, as I said in the reading vlog, I think I know I sound like a broken record when we talk about these things, but I just wish that, you know, we could move away from talking about disability in such an unnuanced way. I can't get away from that when reading it, no matter how, you know, exquisite the writing might be. It just makes me sad. So that, that unfortunately was not a book that I enjoyed. And maybe I shouldn't have ended on that one because now I feel like I've ended on a bit of a deflated note. But, you know, there we go. You win some, you lose some. As I said, a mixed bag last month, hoping to read more books that I love in November. I do have more reading vlogs planned for the rest of this month as well. And um, I would love to know what you read in October and if you have any book recommendations for me. I hope you're all doing okay and I will speak to you very soon. Sending love. Bye.